here we are. Um, hello, everyone. My name's uh, David Berthold, and I'm the director of the Center of uh, Creative Practices here at NIDA. And where I'm in, today, I'm on the lands of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation um, here. And uh, I'm going to pay my respects to their culture and their elders, past, present, uh, and future, and really acknowledge that the land and the land of the almost 500 nations of this land and the surrounding waters have been a place of culture and creative expression for about 3,000 generations now, which is a pretty long time. And um, my guest uh, today is uh, Sean Stewart. Hi, Sean. Hey, David. Hey. So, uh, and you're, you're uh, beaming in today from uh, Los Angeles. I am indeed. Yeah. Uh, now, there's a lot I want to talk to you about. Um, we're talking with Sean because he's uh, written and directed uh, one of the projects for the Digital Theatre Festival, which comes up next week, called Roundabout. And uh, we'll talk about that towards the end of our conversation. But uh, I just want to have a conversation with you, Sean, about some of the uh, phases of your career, actually, because it's pretty extraordinary the kind of diversity of your career, but how they all connect, finally. Um, you're, you're a Texan by birth, but raised in Canada, uh, where I think you took an honours degree in English literature. But theatre theater was very much part of your high school, wasn't it? Kind of acting in a lot of plays and being... Uh, in yeah. yeah, so high school where I grew up uh, started in the 10th grade. And... My high school drama teacher was a guy with a very big personality. Uh, he sang in the chorus of the local opera. He restored muscle cars. And he was big enough to make himself felt on an opera stage. Um, so on the first day of 10th grade, um, we all filed into his office, which is like a little carpeted nook off the gym that in another high school would have been like a changing room or something but instead had couches. And we all sat down on the couches thinking this was funner than being in desks. And he pointed to the corner of the room and he said, there's a box full of scripts, you're on in two weeks. Um, there was absolutely no theoretical training at all. It was just do a play, do a play, do a play, do a play, do a play. So in the three years I was in high school, I acted in 23 shows and I teched on 25 more. Right. Um, and I learned the kinds of things that they don't always teach you in the fancy drama schools. Like if you salt the donuts in the first intermission, you sell more pop in the second intermission. <laughs> um, and I was always a fairly theatrical um, kid. You know, I was the kid who sang the solo in the third grade Christmas pageant kind of kid. Mm. Um, and then after high school, I put myself through college um, uh, writing and designing and acting in in LARPs, which are live action role playing games, mm -hmm. um, like D and D, but it's in a forest for real, um, and also writing murder mystery dinner theater, um, which I got paid fifty dollars to write one, which would take me about forty hours, huh? which benefit of hindsight was not a great trade, mm -hmm. but taught me some skills. And then I had to go in people's houses and be a detective and do all that stuff you do at a murder mystery dinner party. Yeah. Um, I was Alfred the Christmas elf at various shopping mall promotions. And I, uh, the same company that did these things also had medieval feasts. So they would travel around rural Alberta. I grew up on the Canadian prairies. I don't know what the, the equivalent would be in Australia, but if you imagine wherever is not Melbourne or Sydney, um, the, the hometown I grew up in was known as the boiler room of Canada. So now imagine going out from there into the country an hour or two in various directions to various small towns and putting on medieval feasts for the local Rotary Club or Elks Club. And the big thrill was you got to eat meat with your fingers. And when you finished, you got to throw the bones at the gesture, which <laughs> would be me so so i 
I have, I'm sure I'm not the best actor, but I'm more agile at dodging rib pieces than a lot of professionally trained actors are. Well, it's pretty clear all, all that kind of theatrical experience that you've just said, like it's very immersive and interactive and all those words we use, which has been a recurrent theme throughout your career to date. I just want to move to your work as a novelist, because I guess that's the first of your many claims to fame with, you know, a whole parade of novels and winning some big awards too, like the World Fantasy Award, which sounds great. And a, a, New, a New York Times Best Science Fiction Book of the Year winner. Um, there was a lot of books there and across a lot of style kind of you know, cyberpunk and sci-fi and epic fantasies and dark fantasies. And <laughs> yeah, the, the joke with my editor was that out there in America, there were people saying, um, well, if you like Stuart's book, you'll hate the next one. Because yeah. I had a strange, something that was useful in terms of practice, but terrible in terms of building an audience is that I always wanted to, whatever I felt like my weakness was in one book, I would attack with the next. Mm. Um, so in the long run, it was good for building a series of skills, but if it means you're constantly following up your gritty noir detective story with an epic fantasy, which you then in turn follow with a space opera, which you then in turn follow with a fairy tale, it's very hard for an audience. Like eventually I sat down and thought, I don't like that from authors. Right. When I go to, if I go to pick up a John Le Carré book and it's like a Regency romance, I am not happy about that. So, but there was a lot, like I mean, prolific kind of period, particularly in that early period of novels. Um, well, yes, but you have to understand that I wrote nine novels through about six drafts each before I published anything ever, like before I published a movie review. So by the time the I was writing book number 10 when book number five finally came out, which to the rest of the world was the first novel. Um, so so I, had, I had a bit of a head start for a while, but yeah, I, I published, I guess it's 12, 12 novels now. Hmm. And I'm perpetually midway through another one. Um, but other things come up. It's hard to find the time. Yeah. Um, might be fun just to talk a little bit briefly about your Star Wars novel. All right. Didn't know that we were going to go there, but all right. Yoda, Dark Rendezvous. And um, I, I've heard you talk about that novel in the sense that it kind of surprised you in a way because it struck you that writing in that Star Wars universe, you were actually dealing with a kind of religion and writing about kind of the big questions of, you know, truth and pain and well, and the problem of evil and so on. Yeah, yeah. Well, particularly... Um, so this, the story about that is um, I got a call from my agent saying, so the guys at Del Rey are behind on delivering their latest Star Wars book. Um, and in part because they promised to do a Star Wars book that's focused on Yoda. There's never been one. And, and they were at their wits end thinking what that could even be or who could write it. And they apparently went out for lunch to do nothing but sit glumly in a cafe somewhere in Manhattan and try to solve this problem because they were rapidly falling behind schedule. And as they told it to me in the middle of the conversation, they both looked up at the same moment at one another and said, Sean. And I've often thought, what is the path that your life takes to be the answer to that question? <laughs> Like, how do, how do you become the, the go-to, we need a kind of religiously infused action science fantasy adventure. 
like, don't get me wrong. I'm not kicking against the pricks. It is 100% I am that guy. But it was funny to think that other people had noticed. Um, and, and I guess the larger responsibility is, it's not just that Star Wars has uh, a moral universe drawn in broad strokes, though it does. Um, it, it shares that with, you know, the Iliad and the Mahabharata and the Ramayana and the Epic of Gilgamesh, like that stories of gods and monsters that turn around sort of primal relationships um, have always been the most popular form of storytelling. When people decry the prevalence of Marvel movies, I was like, have you not followed all of culture forever? Yeah. Yeah. This is the epic of Gilgamesh is Black Panther with a less likable hero. Um, yeah. uh, but in the particular case of a Yoda novel, not only are you set in the Star Wars universe, but Yoda is the figure who is supposed to dispense wisdom. And, and I'm guessing what you probably read or saw or something is you don't have a lot of time to write these books. I had about four months start to finish. Um, and so they asked me and I, I pitched an idea and they kind of liked it. Uh, but then I had to write this book very fast. And I was also still doing the ARG work. Like I was working full time while I was doing it or mostly full time. Um, so you had to write it very quickly. And as I did that, the realization started to grow on me that this could not be a paycheck job because there is a non-zero number of people who are going to read this book who do not go to church every Sunday, who, who do not go to temple, who do not have a meditative practice, who are just like, kids like me in a basement somewhere in Cleveland. Um, and one day their sister is gonna get a diagnosis or their parents are going to get divorced or their kid is gonna get sick. Um, and this is where they're going to look for a wisdom literature. Like they're going to need Yoda to have something to say about an event in their life that really means something and no pressure, but this may be the only wisdom literature that they have easy access to. This is the framework mm. for a certain number of people. So like, don't screw that up. Mm. You know, write, write a Star Wars novel that is fun and adventurous, but that somehow holds something for that day. Mm. It's not a trivial task. Yeah, and it's, it, it feels to me that one of the key things in your career is the centrality of story and, and really underlying the value of storytelling, you know, in that way that the, the dispensing of wisdom by Yoda is a very, you know, high responsibility. Um, you talked about ARGs there, alternate mm. reality games, which we'll talk about now. But in, in, in the first one you did, I, I, I think I'm right in saying there was a central character in that uh, whose grandmother died. And then the next morning, there were kind of thousands of condolence letters. Yeah, that's which right. Which kind of underlines what you're saying, that sometimes story can occupy a really central pay, place in somebody's life. Like story can be real to people either as a, um, you know, a source of wisdom, but also a really deep emotional attachment that those condolences letters would have expressed to you. Should we? The, in the, so I, my family's from Texas. So though I did not grow up a Baptist, I have a lot of the structures of thought in mind. Mm. And I think in one of the tests we ask of art is that it bear witness. Um, in fact, to go back even before baptism, Baptists, um, the Epic of Gilgamesh ends with 
you know, Enkidu is slain, and what Gilgamesh says is, I will return to the city and tell the story mm. of my friend Enkidu. Like sometimes there's nothing you can do but say, this tragedy or this joy or this wonder befell me and share it. And I think that there is, uh, well, I'm, I'm talking to a theater guy, so I hardly have to explain how much of the root of art and dramatic art is in, is comes out of sacred ritual. Mm. Um, Murcia Eliada, the um, sort of often viewed as the founder of religious studies as a discipline, um, makes the point that that part of the point of ritual is to collapse time. You know, when when you're there and they say the mass or or when you kneel and offer a ring to the girl you want to marry, part of the point of what you're doing is to establish an identity not only as an individual, but a connection through time with everyone who has stood in your shoes. And I think that storytelling in general is that thing that allows us to be both ourselves and universal. It's in one sense, the experience of being in an audience, of uh, being moved by a work of art is the, the corollary of um, Goethe has a famous line where he says, um, the nature of genius is to know in your heart that what is true for you is true for all mankind. Mm. And when I first heard that, I thought, well, that's arrogant and misses the point of cultural relativism because I didn't actually get the point. Um, uh, the, the point that he's, he's going for is that sense that if you can lay your finger on that moment at which you know, if I can connect with a middle-aged woman from a fitting aristocratic family who may or may not have to sell a cherry orchard, then we've accomplished something really profound. You know, that, that moment at which I become you, um, I become someone else and I become able to imagine what it is to be others in a community um, is a, it's a foundational moment, like yeah. that. It's the source of empathy, among other things. Yeah, I think that's very true. Um, maybe we should unpack a little uh, how it came to be that you know those thousands of condolences, condolence letters were sent for the death of a fictional character, um, which was that first ARG, that first alternate reality game, where you and and a group of colleagues were essentially the inventors of that form. And the guy, the guy we had on the stream yesterday, yeah, was the guy who came up with the first idea. Yeah, and that first idea, I think, was attached to the Kubrick uh, Steven Spielberg film film AI. That's right. Uh, back in two thousand and one. So, I wonder if you just kind of show us what 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 is an alternate reality game that you form that you and Jordan and others kind of created together. Um, and then how, how did that play out? You know, I, I, I think it was the, the first trailer for, for the film AI. There, there are a number of ways to get to it, but the trailer is a good one. Um, mm -hmm. The first, the, let me step back. Yeah. So what is an alternate reality game is um, you can, call it a treasure hunt or you can call it a serial novel. The easiest way is to, as you said, sort of explain what happened and then the rest will make sense. So there was among a certain group of, of sort of nerdy film people, there was a lot of anticipation, not all of it positive um, for AI because you know Stanley Kubrick and Steven Spielberg are a funny combination of auteurs to tackle subject matter. Mm. But eventually a poster came out for the film and that poster uh, was also a version of it was in the credit block 
of this little online teaser. And on that list of credits, if you looked very hard or you froze the frame and read it all off the video, you could see there was a credit for someone called Janine Sala, sentient machine therapist. And if you decided to look up sentient machine therapist or Janine Sala, Sala on Alta Vista, because that's how long ago this was, there was no, only the cool kids had just now heard about Google, which was an invitation only. It was an invitation only beta. Um, so you were on some other search engine and you typed in Janine Sala or sentient machine therapist, and you found a website which was sort of um, her listing uh, as a faculty member on the campus of uh, Bangalore World University's New York campus. And if you clicked on the various links, you would find literally 70 other web pages, like department after department of Bangalore World University, meteorology, geology, all their staff members and what they taught and what their course syllabuses were and all that sort of thing. And everything inside that world appeared to be dated 2142. Um, and Janine Sala on her webpage had links to like her homepage. Um, and you could go to her homepage where her family stuff was. And it also listed her phone number in case you wanted to call and set an appointment with her. Um, and if you called that phone number, you heard a message saying, hey, can't take your call right now. I'm out of town um, at the funeral of my friend, Evan Chan. Um, I hope to be back next week and I'll try to get back to you then. And should you then go and put Evan Chan's name in your search engine, you would find that he had died under mysterious circumstances because there would be a little squib in a local paper also dated 2142. And now you're into a murder mystery, right? So you could look up the autopsy report and it turned out that he had a web page which had a password protected sort of secret diary. But if you were clever or you knew someone who was, or you just followed online until you met someone clever, then you could figure out the password and read the secret diary. Hmm. So if you imagine, basically it's just Charles Dickens, right? It's just a serial novel, but it plays out over websites and phones and bits of video that all purport to be real and true artifacts from this world of 2142, then you would follow these characters through the mystery, just as if, think of it as a different way of reading our mutual friend or great expectations, um, but one designed with the internet in mind. Yeah. Does that give you, is that at yeah. all a bit of a sense? Yeah, totally. And I, th I think it's fair to say that one of the principles of an alternate reality game is that they're not declared. You know, you don't promote the fact of the game. It's... Um, we'd probably would now, but we wouldn't then. Mm. Um, it was very important to us at the time that... Um, so, one of the phrases that is associated with that work is um, an aesthetic usually acronymed as TINAG, T-I-N-A-G, which stands for this is not a game. So as much as humanly possible, nothing about it said, this is a work of entertainment, other than it's not 2142. Yeah. So there's a magic circle there, right? Anyone who touches it knows it's not actually websites for 2142. Mm. But inside that, we tried never to break that frame. Yeah. Now, a lesser known story is that that is not even remotely what that phrase initially meant on that project. Um, I mentioned before that the basic, to use a term of art from game design, the basic game loop for an alternate, for that alternate reality game was you find a piece of story and then you are blocked like the secret web page mm -hmm. until you can find a password. And then you find another piece of story. So story, puzzle, story, puzzle, story, puzzle. Make sense? Yeah. Okay. The difficulty with that for me was that 
people get super invested in solving the puzzles and parsing out all the text to figure out how it might be a clue that would let them advance. And while that was super cool and very engaging and kept people really on it, it also tended to make them focus on the content as keys for ciphers rather than as on storytelling. Mm. So I was talking with my sort of co-creators and I was saying, I'm really tired of everyone thinking of these as events in a puzzle. This is not a game. I'm going to write a scene that is so clearly and incontrovertibly emotional that it, they understand that at least some of the time when they touch this thing, they have to approach it as if it were a novel or a film. Hmm. There will also be moments they can approach it as a puzzle or a game, but some of the time they need, I need as an artist, I want them feeling, I want them weeping and crying and laughing and being amused and all those things that we as artists like. So when the moment came that that main character's grandmother died and I woke up and there were a thousand condolence emails and those emails said, not only I'm so sorry for your loss because I knew her email, mm. um, but some of them said, uh, I was raised by my grandmother too, and I'm so sorry for what you're going through. And a couple of them said, I lost my grandfather last week. I'm right there with you. And that was extraordinary for me. That was a thunderbolt because that is not an experience you have as a novelist, mm -hmm. that immediacy and depth. And I realized part of it is because the character that they were talking to they saw little snippets of video from, they got emails from periodically, they had a website. In other words, they had just as much contact with that character as you might have with a cousin in Melbourne. And that makes sense of the phrase alternate reality. It's an alternate reality. Yeah. The most brilliant phrase about describing an alternate reality game that I know is a player was once giving an interview to someone saying, what is this crazy thing? And what do you do? Do you play a part? Do you play a role? And he said, so you do play a character. That character is exactly like you in every detail, except they think it's real. Right. <laughs> so that project was called The Beast. Um, it, is, it is now called The Beast. At the time, it was the AI web mystery. The, yeah. this, the reason for that nickname is when we make things in theater, I'm sure it's the same. You have to come up with a props list or a set list, all the things you'll need. So the very first time we sat down to think of the, the assets we would need, it turned out the list was 666 items long. <laughs> Hence, the nickname was born. Great. Um, let, let's talk briefly about um, I Love Bees. Um, you know, particularly, you know, a cultural phenomenon, actually. And which was associated with the launch of Halo 2, the Xbox, Microsoft. That's game. right. That's right. Um, yeah. So just step us through that a little bit. Um, so very quickly, the brief was, um, Microsoft wanted to launch Halo 2 and they wanted to do something for Halo 2 that would go beyond a gaming title and become a cultural phenomenon. And we were like, okay, uh, check, what's the <laughs> plot? And they said, oh, you know, aliens come to earth. And we were like, okay, cultural phenomenon, aliens come to the earth. Okay, War of the Worlds. Um, and once we were at War of the Worlds, War of the Worlds solved another problem for us, which, hey kids listening at home, when you're working on big secretive billion dollar IPs, they're not gonna give you any visual assets. They're not gonna show you pictures of stuff. You're not gonna get pictures of actors in costume because that's all being saved for the traditional marketing campaign down the road. So make a cultural phenomenon out of Halo 2. No, you can't show anything ever. War of the Worlds, radio play. Hmm. All right, audio we can do. So we started thinking, how could we, what is an entertaining way that we could distribute a big story? And that story would be partly in the year 2004 and partly in the year 2642. Um, 
sometime in the 27th century. I can't remember exactly when, actually. And we wanted to have that radio play thing, but we couldn't possibly afford to buy airtime on radio stations all over the world. So we started talking about pirate radio, like building our own radio transmitters all over the world. And then my partner on that project and on all of these projects, he's a brilliant game designer named Delon Lee, who your audience will most likely know as the founder of the company Exploding Kittens, which makes a card game called Exploding Kittens that is on the shelf for a number of people in this audience right now because it's the number one tabletop game in the world. Ilan and I did a lot of the building of these ARGs together. Um, me as story guy and designer and him as designer and story guy. Um, and Ilan looked up when we were thinking, when we had come to the conclusion there was no way of creating enough pirate radio stations to do what we wanted. He said, you know, there are pay phones. And if you think of it, a pay phone's kind of a little broadcast tower and they're already all over the world. So if we made a story and we cut it up into little pieces and we broadcast those little pieces to pay phones and we just put a website up that had nothing on it except GPS locations and times. And then people would show up not having any idea what to expect on an empty street. And then this phone would ring. And there felt like something really magical about that moment when you, that can't possibly be for us, is it? Um, so we built this, this game that had a War of the Worlds story broadcast over the International Payphone Network. It seemed to make sense at the time. And what's the bees part of that? The jars of honey and the ah, bees? So, so the idea was for this, we would want a central website. Um, and the conceit uh, was that a 26th century artificial intelligence of the sort that runs spaceships in the Halo world um, like Cortana, which is now the name of Halo's, the name of the Microsoft personal assistant, right, is taken from the ship's AI in Halo because Halo was a big deal back in the day. Um, so an AI like Cortana um, had suffered a serious malfunction and had basically crash landed in the 20th century or early 21st century in our time. And so the shattered pieces of it would land on a website and it would slowly try to reassemble itself with seven centuries old technology. And what we thought would be evocative and funny would be the furthest thing from that that we could possibly imagine. So we made it the website of an amateur um, bee farmer who had like a couple of little hives called I love bees with little happy sunny things on which there is this ferocious 27th century military AI who suffered terrible brain damage, slowly putting itself back together. So in the middle of this harmless lady's you know, site about I love making clover honey, write me for my recipes, um, there was this giant thing that just appeared saying, um, uh, it, was, it had a countdown and on the countdown, it said, you know, 17 days and 14 hours until this unit becomes uh, metastasizes and becomes wide awake and physical. You have been warned. Um, so it's just a juxtaposition between yeah. a very banal thing and a very. And people got jars of honey and the post and all sorts of things. Yes. And you talked about you talked about the payphones. I think there were, there were well there were millions of people involved in this game, and I love these you know at various kind of points. But I think I'm right in saying when you when those GPS coordinates were kind of embedded in this website, that actually someone turned up to every single payphone. Uh, sooner or later, yeah, it took. I mean, we gave them a few chances, and also. Our GPS coordinates were not always perfect. It turns out, here's another pro tip, no. not all GPS devices are equally good. 
So around the time you're monitoring players' conversations and they're saying, we're here, we've got the boat, we're circling in San Francisco Bay, but we don't see anything. And you know they're supposed to find a payphone. It is possible that you have made a mistake. Um, the first day of I Love Bees is when we coined the phrase, the fog of entertainment, because it was so incredibly confusing for everybody. Mm. But they worked it out because audiences do. Yeah. Give them any time. There is something to work out. It's, it's, it's kind of like uh, storytelling as archaeology in a way, um, because you and your colleagues, you know, create this whole um, complete story and then smash it to pieces and leave it around everyone, leave it around everywhere, kind of breadcrumbs to be found and just wait for people to kind of dig it up and make sense of all the bits and pieces. Yeah. Which there's an art to that, but yeah, that's basically it. I mean, the story has to be coherent and you have to be a little careful about how you break it. And mm. I've learned a lot of things over time about what's fun for people to figure out and what's not fun. What, what, are, what are they willing to do and what are they not willing to do? Mm. Um, but that basic act of, listen, there are two things we do on the internet. We look things up and we gossip. So we made a form of art that's basically you look stuff up and you gossip about it. Humans like both those things. Yeah, right. I once uh, had a talk at Intel where they said, what is the most interesting thing about alternate reality games? What is the most interesting thing you did? And I said, at the end of the day, the most interesting thing is not anything we did. It's the nature of the audience. It's very unusual to have a collective audience. When you have 200 people in a playhouse or a cinema, you have 200 people having a single player experience, but they're doing it in company. An alternate reality game isn't like that. It's more like science. It's literally like the science of, of the age of Darwin reimagined as an entertainment platform. Hmm. Yeah. Um, let's, let's weave our way back to theater now. And um, Earlier this year, you were working on a project with the Royal Shakespeare Company. Um, I know you can't say too much about that, but it, it kind of got, you know, done in by COVID. I know it was when we connected. So bringing all those things through as, as a novelist and as, you know, working on those ARGs and so on, moving into, you know, one of the, well, a classical theatre company. Like, what was that like, kind of making that kind of journey back into theatre? Well, first of all, I'm a kid from the Canadian prairies with an English degree. Mm. So how fun is it to sit in the windmill in Stratford, which was built in 1600, and have a glass of cider in a place that Shakespeare probably pulled a pint of ale sometime? Um, you know, it's, I, if I may, without offense, speak to you as a fellow colonial, I think the Brits don't quite understand what it's like for us to go there from our far flung places and go to a place that if you're literary, right? For me, London is an unending, is, is haunted by Sherlock, and Pip and Fagan and um, uh, Dorian Gray and Jeeves and Worcester. You know, it's a it's a it's a city full of literary ghosts, and it's a country full of that language. So it was incredible for me to go back um, to sort of ground zero for for English literature. It was fun to feel like. You know, I had a little, a little thing to contribute, um, a small thing in the history of theater, but a, a useful thing right now, uh, a little, a little different sense of what audiences will do and enjoy and how it could be fun for them mm. and how to play with them. Mm. Um, although it may not sound like it from some of the stuff we've been talking about, I'm not much of a fan of experimental 
I'm not much of a fan of any kind of work of art that you have to read the little card under the painting to know what the painting was about. Yeah. Um, I, I work in high tech stuff all the time, but I'm not moved by projects that are interesting thought experiments. I'm moved by things that move me. Um, if you come to our show and you think it's interesting, that's great. But mostly I hope you think it's funny. I hope that you see the characters and respond to them and think the situations are amusing and maybe find yourself unexpectedly touched when you weren't really thinking that was going to happen in this sort of a show. Um, if you come out of there saying, wow, mind blown, heart unmoved, that's a fail for me. Yeah. Um, and I must say it was, it was a little bit of a surprise to me when we first had a conversation about what you might do at NIDA. And, um, you know, I was very grateful that you first said yes, so that was nice. Um, but then your thought for a show would, was to write a farce. And, you know, a very traditional form. You said, like, you know, I want it to be a kind of, you know, mix between A Midsummer Night's Dream and Noises Off or something, you know. Right. And, uh, and as you say, like a classic form, but, you know, using technology, but technology wasn't the subject. I mean, the, the, the subject were these three people in a love triangle and the comedy that comes from that and the heart that comes from that. Um, so the time's probably come to talk a little bit about Roundabout actually and sort of what led you to that idea. Well, let me first talk about the, the meta point there. Mm. Um, I've done a great deal of work at this point in my career that doesn't look like you expect it to. It's not a book, it's not a movie. Mm. You don't already understand all the rules for interacting with it. If you're going to be the first person ever to do abstract art, you might want to abstract something that people can recognize. Like don't start at um, paint splatters um, because that is puzzling. One of the beauties of having an unusual method is that I get to tell stories like boy meets girl and it feels like you've never seen it before. And you'd be an idiot to instead pick very recherche, uh, inscrutable topic matter to present in an, an unusual and unfamiliar format, because now you just, everyone watching is just hearing white noise on their television. Mm. So a general rule of thumb is the more formally innovative you are, weirdly, the closer you can hew to the great stories. Yeah. Like, there's a reason that you, James Joyce's Ulysses is about Ulysses, right? Mm. It's, it is allowed its range of formal experiment because it's got the scaffolding of a couple of stories that everybody knows already. It's a reason that Sleep No More, it's not really Macbeth, but they tell people it's Macbeth and it makes, gives people some yeah. kind of a box to put around that experience, right? Um, now that we are doing plays on Zoom, did I just do a terribly unlucky thing? Is this a theater now? No, it doesn't count. No, it doesn't oh. count. No. Whew, thank God. Um, so, so the central, from my background, I will, I will say the formal experimental part first, but then we'll move on from that. The thing that I know that people from a more traditional theater background might not know is how much fun people have online gossiping about stuff. You know this actually, because you know friends who live tweet the Oscars and you can tell that they're having a great time doing it. Or people show you memes where they take little things from TV shows or movies and they put captions to them and they express their lives through them. You know that's fun, but it has never occurred to you that that can be part of like the experience of going to see Hedda Gobbler. But that's kind of my stock and trade, is knowing that people have a lot of fun with, the, with each other in a social experience while they're experiencing a work of art. So 
knowing that your actors might have to just act from their bedrooms and you couldn't get people to come to a physical theater, I wanted to, the thing I, I said to you is, I wanna put it on a show on a streaming platform because the most important structural format of a streaming platform is it has a video window like the one you and I are talking on now. But right next to that, it has a little channel where people can comment on the action, where the audience gets to talk. And the pitch I made to you was both of those things are stages. And I just want to write a show that crosses back and forth between those two stages. Um, so the high concept for Roundabout is very simply that in that video screen, there is a standard setup for a kind of show that we all know, I think, which is about a love triangle. There, there are two young women and a young man. There are two characters who are straight and one that's gay. And, you know, they're, they're balked in the ways that you are when you are at the beginning of a play with a love triangle in it. And they're in that Zoom window. But over in the chat channel, there are three more characters. There are digital characters who have decided that they've had enough time wandering around in the universe of the internet and they want to be back in bodies again. So they're going to ask for the help of you, the audience, to pick which one of those humans to download into. So now we're basically playing musical chairs because we've got six people, but only three bodies for them to fit into and they keep switching around. Mm. So now, as you have your initial love triangle gets varied up because you might have two straight people and a gay person, but now the gay person is inside the bodies of one of the straight people. And that changes all the dynamics. <laughs> that without giving too much away, one of the plays that I might have been working on with the RSC was going to premiere on Midsummer Night. It's kind of the same plot, right? <laughs> Um, we have young lovers and then they get confused about who they are. So in Roundabout, we have this game of musical chairs of too many people trying to fit into too few bodies. And there is a character who sort of serves the role of Puck, the trickster, but serves it in alliance with you, the audience. So you and Puck, kind of between you mess with things a little and then kind of have to clean it up a little. So as, as things become increasingly more frenetic and the stakes get higher because farce um, or indeed drama, mm. um, it turns out that it's also up to the audience to try to, uh, to save the situation a little bit, should they care to. Yeah. So the, the play you've written is, I think, 350 pages long. It's a long, it's a long script, given that <laughs> it was on page zero in April 28th, I think I started writing. Right. So pretty quick work. And, it, and it's 350 pages long because you've had to actually write every kind of yeah. way the story might go. Exactly. If the audience chooses to put the character of Alpha into the character of Pat at the beginning, well, one train of things starts to happen. Mm -hmm. If the audience instead chooses to put a different character inside a different body, then another train of things starts to happen. Mm -hmm. And you have to sort of be true to those choices and make sure that whichever path any given night's performance goes down, has things that are surprising, has things that are funny, has things hopefully that are moving. Um, it pays off. So nobody ever thinks, oh man, I went to the dull one. Um, and some interesting environments too. I mean, they're not just people sitting, the, the, cat, the, the real life characters as it were, the three characters with bodies at the yes. beginning, and not just sitting in their bedrooms. I mean, one of them is in a yurt in Uzbekistan. Yes, yes. One of our one of our characters is a would be young entrepreneur who has decided that internet cafes can't be a thing on the steps because the people are nomadic. And so she's made an internet yurt, which her plan, and I will don't want to spoil it, but it may not be the best business model in the world. 
right. is to take a yurt around not the big cities of Uzbekistan, but you know, out in rural Uzbekistan, servicing the broadband needs. Anyway, it doesn't go great. Yeah. Um, but there she is in her yurt in Uzbekistan. It's, um, a big, it's a big story, you know, really funny and a really moving kind of do no more, I guess, a very moving conclusion. I hope so. I hope so. Um, I, I didn't write the denouement until, I don't know, the second week of June. I had a version of the ending, but the real ending wasn't there until after the character. The actors started rehearsing on, I guess, June the 8th. They got the script for the first time. Mm -hmm. And I don't think I wrote the true emotional heart of the play until the 15th or so. So yeah. very much, we were all discovering as we were going along because I was writing yeah. the play and directing the play at the same time. Um, it's a saying in, in the games and tech industry, the usual phrase is, we're building the plane and flying the plane at the same time. Right. But this was that to a fairly extreme level. Yeah. So live streams on Twitch, doesn't it? Um, is where That's right. find it. Yeah, which is for gamers mostly, isn't it? Um, it's, it's basically a version of a platform like Facebook Live, but it grew out of the gaming community. So um, what a lot of people do is watch other people play video games, which seems really weird. But then on the other hand, I can watch soccer and baseball. So um, one of the things I liked about it as a place to be is that it has that, it has an audience that is familiar with, we both watch a story in the video window, but we also comment and have a relationship between ourselves and the game where we were watching over here in the chat stream. Mm -hmm. So it, it has, it is already built to support the kind of um, blurring of the line between audience and actor that I was looking for. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's a terrific way of telling a great story, I must say. And I'm really looking forward to so that, that opens next week. And if people want to find out about that, they just, they just, just Google, Digital Theatre Festival Nida, and it'll pop up. It'll be the first thing there um, to see that. Just to finish up, Sean, I might just talk a little bit about the future of theatre. And um, because you do have some really interesting thoughts about uh, feeling that it might actually, theatre might be heading into a really interesting age. I, I do. I'm. Let me. Well, the provocative version, I, I wrote a little post which got picked up a little bit with the bold assertion that theater was positioned to leapfrog back over a film as the central form of dramatic art for the 21st century. Let me make the argument, then you can decide how much you buy it um, and in what ways it's true. I probably don't mean that people are going to be flooding into playhouses to be watch, to watch Death of a Salesman and that that will topple the latest Marvel movie. But here's what I'm thinking. In the 20th century, I think cinema had uh, an advantage over theater that was overwhelming, which is that cinema scales. You shoot a film once and you can sell a million tickets. Gone with the Wind has sold 201 million tickets, not counting its presence on TV or streamers, just theater tickets, 201 million. Very hard to fit that many people in even a big house. Um, theater, you're stuck in however many people you can get into your theater and you have to pay the cast to do it all again tomorrow and you have to pay to keep the theater open and the lights and the crew and all that stuff. So economically, it's just impossible for theater to compete with film um, in terms of breadth of distribution and in the long term, the ability to make back money. Uh, obviously, there are, there are shows on Broadway, there are Cameron McIntosh and the West End, like you can make a lot of money in theater, don't get me wrong, but as a general thing, it's, the scalability of, of film is 
hard for theater to compete with in the 20th century. I think what Roundabout proves, and a lot of things prove, is that if I take a play and I put it on Twitch, I could have 700,000 people watch that play. I could have more people watch a single performance of a play on Twitch. Um, well, I'll go as far as to say, if you look at something like Fortnite, um, the Epic game, uh, a Fortnite island, they set aside an island to have a reveal of the teaser for the last Star Wars film. Um, did they have more people there for that than would fit in every Cineplex Odeon in the planet? Possibly. They certainly could. Mm. Certainly in Twitch, you can put more people than will fit in every theater in Australia. And they, there are shows that do that every day on Twitch. So I think what I just said there is we've just erased the scalability advantage, at least in terms of reach. There's still the issue that if you do something live, if you're doing it again the next day, you have to do it again. But at least you can now get in numbers of people that are absolutely comparable to television or cinema. So obviously I have a bias, but I believe that 21st century art is going to be increasingly marked by engagement with the audience. I have a lot of reasons for believing that, but one of the simplest ones is we make art on this device now. Every person here is watching this interview on a device that has buttons that turn the volume up and turn the volume down and has tabs you can go to, you can swipe it left, you can swipe it right. It interacts, it is made to interact in a way that a television or a book is not. And our audiences increasingly want to interact um, and want to engage with story. Not necessarily in a way that's hard, not necessarily at the same time, but a stat, I know you know this because I know we've talked about it, but for people in the audience who do not know, um, I find the, I'm very interested in the world of fan fiction, which is people writing stories in established worlds. It is useful to note that on a single fan fiction website called Archive of Our Own, there are more complete Harry Potter stories than there are words in the first five novels. Amazing. Not only has JK Rowling written no more, you know, far less than 1% of all the material ever written about Harry Potter, JK Rowling has written less than 50% of all the material ever read about Harry Potter. That is a very different world. Hmm. That is a world in which we as authors have to understand our relationship with our audiences differently. So if you're, if you're thinking that somehow the art of the 21st century is going to be more about engagement and more about experience, I happen to know really a lot about making interactive stories. The most common format people use to do that is something called choose your own adventure, basic or branching narrative. So you can choose whether the character goes left or right. You can do it, it's super hard. Video games do it, but a AAA video game costs $600 million to make. Um, if you spent $10 million, you might be able to make an episode, a single episode of television like the Bandersnatch episode of Black Mirror, which does this about as well as you can do it, but it's an incredibly expensive gimmick. A live actor can respond to a live audience in real time, and that guy makes $15 waiting tables at Wendy's when he's not in your show. And he's better at it than that $500 million video game. So I suddenly started thinking one of the reasons I wanted to write the show, not the only one, but was, oh my God, there is a huge untapped advantage. Theater's ability to be live, if we leaned into it, if we let them play with how online audiences like to play, suddenly we're talking about something that is very compelling and has the possibility of being the kind of thing people do on a Saturday night in a way that 60 years ago they went to the movies. Yeah. And to drop one last argument, if all that sounds really far-fetched to you, if you just cannot imagine a world in which 
people are watching Twitch and interacting with a play and talking to one another about it. And that's where the money is. When you and I were in college, bands toured to support albums. Now bands drop albums to support tours. Content is perceived as something you can pirate off BitTorrent. An experience has value. Theater has a chance to be the dramatic thing that is live, that is responsive, and that creates an experience. So I like its odds. Yeah, that's a really comforting thing to hear from someone like you, Sean Stewart. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, and Roundabout, you know, is another foray into that area, uh, into the future of a kind of theatre and a kind of storytelling. So thank you for your time today. It's been very generous of you spending time today. Uh, thank you. Well, as you know, as soon as we finish here, I'm back to tech because it's that week. <laughs> yeah. So looking forward to seeing the show. I know it'll be extraordinary. Well, I'm extraordinarily, let me say before we sign off that I feel incredibly lucky to have had the chance to do it. And I think it was so brave of you to let me come take this crazy shot. And I've had such a good experience working with you, working with Dai, and working with the students on this project project who have been incredible. They're so talented. They work so hard. Um, it's just been a joy. I know. They've, they've loved walking, working with you too, I know. All right. I'll see you soon. Enjoy tech. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Yeah. Bye.